Now, this is where like the just the disgusting part of me comes out. When somebody beautiful or like with somebody with like, great boobs dies, I'm sadder. I'm like, oh, that's a real, <laughs> that's a shame. It's a travesty. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down the Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we ask, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Gene Lyons. Alongside me are my co-hosts, Carrie Gross. Good evening. And Big D, Dick Ebert. I hate a guy with a car and no sense of humor. Or do we like, all right, you meathead, the joke's over. That's my Annie impersonation. They both suck. (laughs) I'm I'm going back to good evening. (laughs) And each week, we'll take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. Each week, the audience selects from six movie choices that we break out in our race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. And at the end of the podcast, the three of us will provide the audience with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective bums. So find a comfortable spot on the sofa and accompany us for a journey through our vast VHS movie collections. If you'd like to download Shat the Movies, you can catch us on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are found. It's October, guys. Woo! Yeah, last Ooh. year we... <laughs> a little more than five. <laughs> Yeah, so so last year we waited, I think, until like the week before Halloween. We were like, oh, okay, guess <laughs> guess what? It's Halloween. And then we tried to pack in two movies within a week. It was terrible. So this year we decided to, you know, plan a little bit further ahead. It's the season of Halloween. And then perfectly, one of the most iconic horror movie franchises from the 80s has a sequel coming out on the 18th of the month, what could be a finale to the franchise with Jamie Lee Curtis back. So we said, you know what? Let's just call an audible and let's just do something we've only done once before. Go back to the 70s and cover 1978's John Carpenter's iconic Halloween. Yeah, Big D, I'm super excited about this because I think of all the holiday movie genres, Halloween, like spooky movies are are the greatest, right? Better than Christmas movies, better than, I guess, what, Thanksgiving movies, certainly better than Easter movies. And, and it was exciting to see that our audience totally agreed. The, the level of excitement when we just asked a simple question on Twitter, you know, what scary movie should we do? It was just like an avalanche of suggestions. Well, you don't have to ask me, the resident goth, how I feel about scary movies in October. Come on, get off that crutch. <laughs> we get it. You're a goth. You're dark. <laughs> All right, so Halloween is a 1978 American slasher film directed and scored by John Carpenter and starring Donald Pleasance and Jamie Lee Curtis in her film debut. The film tells the story of a serial killer, Michael Myers, as he stalks and kills teenage babysitters on Halloween night. The film predominantly focuses on Michael, who was committed to a sanitarium as a child for the murder of his older sister, Judith. Fifteen years later, he escapes to stalk and kill the people of the fictional town of Haddonfield, Illinois while being chased by his former psychiatrist, Samuel Loomis. The film was shot in the spring of 1978 in Southern California and was released on October 25th. It grossed $70 million worldwide, selling almost 30 million tickets in 1978 and becoming one of the most profitable independent films. Primarily praised for its direction and musical score, many credit the film as the first in a long line of slasher films inspired by Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Some critics have suggested that Halloween may encourage sadism and misogyny by audiences identifying with its villain. Others have suggested the film is a social critique of the immorality of youth and teenagers in the 1970s, with many of Meyer's victims being sexually promiscuous substance abusers, while the lone heroine is depicted as innocent and pure, hence her survival. Nonetheless, Carpenter dismisses such analysis. Halloween spawned a film franchise consisting of seven successful films, a remake in 2007, which itself was followed by a sequel in 2009 an 11th installment, which serves as a direct sequel to the original film that ignores the sequels to the original, is set to be released, as you said, Big D, this year, with Jamie Lee Curtis reprising her role for the fourth time in the series. So a storied history on this movie, uh, and I'm sure everyone's got their their memories of it. I, I think everyone I know is a Halloween fan. Big D, where were you when you first saw Halloween? 
so this is uh, one of those iconic movies that you remember as a kid. You remember what you felt, and it fucking terrified me. This isn't a monster movie, something that's implausible. You know, you're not going to have, I I don't believe, there's not going to be a werewolf or uh, Dracula. This was something that could happen to you. It could be a neighbor who's got an issue. You didn't know when you were going to be safe. Even kids were in danger. So it it fucked with me. But what was weird was, my as I'm watching it this time, because I haven't watched it in a few years, I kept expecting some things to happen and they didn't. So I looked it up and when they were filming Halloween 2, and Halloween 1 was going to be on TV, they realized when they cut it down for television viewers, the film was too short. So they needed extra material. So while they were filming Halloween 2, which Carpenter wrote and co-produced, but he didn't direct, they used that opportunity to get the actors and filmed a whole bunch of extra material that didn't exist in the movie. So this time through, it was almost like a new experience for me. It was a new experience for me. This was the first time I had seen it. And uh, I honestly, you know, after having seen the iconic mask from Halloween and having a ton of friends who are big Halloween uh, fans, I expected, as you said, Big D, like some crazy supernatural shit going on. And it was really pretty straightforward. Uh, What was interesting to me, though, is for some reason, like I'd seen all the Nightmare on Elm Street movies and almost all the Friday the 13th movies. Somehow I just avoided this entire franchise. Uh, So this was like a glaring hole in my slasher viewing repertoire. And I'm really glad we got the opportunity to watch it. Yeah, same for me. I I feel like I had seen parts of it, um, but then watching it in its entirety this week, I was surprised that I I don't think I've ever sat down and watched it as a whole. Um, And I would consider myself like a, you know, a horror fan and a John Carpenter fan. But the same, you know, I can re you know hash the whole scripts of all the nightmare on elm streets and child's play but this i wasn't sure of the plot while it was happening but i'm not a stranger to being afraid to walk to my car alone at night or checking the shower before i get in the shower and i think these kind of movies gave us that you know all right big d that being said let's roll the trailer halloween night a small american town Fifteen years ago. Michael? I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. In 1963, on Halloween night in Haddonfield, Illinois, Michael Myers inexplicably stabs his sister Judith to death with a kitchen knife in their home. He is subsequently hospitalized at Warren County's Smith's Grove Sanitarium. Fifteen years later, on the night of October 30th, Michael's child psychiatrist, Dr. Sam Loomis, arrives at a sanitarium to escort Michael to court. Michael escapes from the sanitarium, stealing Loomis's car, returning home to Haddonfield. He kills a mechanic for his uniform and steals a white mask, knives, and rope from a local hardware store. Yeah, so so you touched on it, Gene, in, in the in the intro description. Let's all realize this movie was made on three hundred thousand dollars. So a lot of the things that the budget put limitations on, they had to be creative. Whether it was with the the camera work, whether it was with the special effects, where Friday the Thirteenth and maybe Nightmare on Elm Street is all about showing the murder and showing the blood. Uh, for a horror movie, this movie was surprisingly blood free. Not only was it such a small budget, but they shot it in 20 days. So I tried to keep that in mind when I was, you know, maybe getting frustrated with there not being a lot of blood or getting frustrated with the lack of acting skills that, 
You know, this was an independent film shot on a small budget in 20 days. And I think Carpenter relies more on rather than gore and the slasher aspect of things. He builds suspense with soundtrack and the absence of dialogue and the absence of running and things like that. So I I kept that in mind while deciding my score. I think an interesting thing about the movie as well is just the, kind of the interesting cast, both on screen and off screen, that came to put this movie together. Of course, you had Jamie Lee Curtis, but uh, Donald Pleasance, you know, not the type of actor that you would really just suspect would be in kind of a, as I would call it, a slasher flick. Also, you know, John Carpenter taking care of both uh, film and score is really kind of an, an odd, or not an odd, but a, um, a, a very unique John Carpenter thing to do. And what was really interesting is, is the producer... I, I can't help it. It's a Middle Eastern name. I'm I'm watching the movie, and as the credits are rolling on, I see Mustafa Akkad, and I'm like, okay, what's the story with Mustafa? Um, and it's actually a really interesting story. So this guy, before he did Halloween, and by the way, he was involved in the production of all the first eight Halloweens. And uh, this guy, before he did that, his movie credit before that was he did a movie called Muhammad Messenger of God, which was literally like a biopic on Muhammad. That was his movie that he did before Halloween. Um, and, and sadly, uh, in 2005, uh, Mustafa Akkad and his daughter, uh, who was 34 years old at the time, uh, died in the bombings in Amman, Jordan. So they were both in the lobby at the Grand Hyatt when the bomb exploded and she died instantly. He died two days later in a hospital. So a very tragic end. But it, it was just such an interesting amalgam of, of all these different talents coming together to make this movie uh, for, again, something that was shot very quickly on a very small budget. That's very impressive. Yeah, I can almost picture them on set. Nobody knew what this was going to be. It was a lot of unknowns. It was people without experience. It was, uh, I mean, I'll get into the end. The the credits are like 30 seconds. You know, every crew member had multiple jobs. This was as independent as you could get. And the iconic music that you mentioned and that Carpenter, he gets a bit fucking wild later with like Big Trouble in Little China and Escape from New York. Here, he did the entire title sequence, the score in three days. And the iconic song that everybody thinks of once you hear this movie, the the, the few of the piano keys and, and the drums, it was based on a drumming exercise on the bongos that his father had taught him when he was a kid. So when he needed a score, he didn't have money. He just sat back down and and did what he had learned as a kid. And it's so simple, but it's creepy and terrifying at the same time. And without this theme, I don't know that the movie is remembered the way it is today and is not as uh, you know ingrained in everybody's brain. I was just reading an interview um, because the new Halloween is coming out with Jamie Lee Curtis in it that, you know, she was so worried that she wasn't going to get this spot, you know, with all the auditions and all the other actresses he'd had in mind. But because of how low the budget was, like he had to go with a no name. And um, I guess she was really good at him cueing her on how terrified she needed to be for certain scenes. But there was zero budget for uh, wardrobe. And so she took $100 and went to JCPenney. And the entire wardrobe that she's wearing in the film is like her own clothes that she bought, picking out for her idea of what the character should wear. And I think that's that says a lot for a 20-year-old in her first film is that she really does nail it portraying the character in the way that Carpenter had the idea of. Interestingly enough, that's exactly what my mom did every year for back to school. She gave me a hundred dollars and took me to JC <laughs> and that's how I ended up with like corduroys and uh, my hush puppies. Make it but, work. You know, we talk about we talk about how low budget this movie was, and uh, it caused me to be really inventive. And when I when the movie first started rolling, and we see the opening scene, and you're you're looking at it from the killer's perspective. I was really annoyed at first at the camera work. It was kind of making me a little motion sick. And I was imagining this audience in the theater in 1978, probably people just barfing. You know, they're, they're chugging those 3% beers, you know, teenagers, and they're just puking in the aisles. Um, but it, it really was the most exciting kill of the movie. And they did a great job, like, obscuring the identity, keeping a mystery. Like, who is this killer? I really like that part. Okay, I thought the opposite of it being annoying or making me feel sick. I felt like it was suspenseful and I was trying to keep in mind what was happening that I don't think a movie had done that at this point. You know, we've seen so many horrors now and zombie movies and like Blair Witch and this trying to make it seem B movie and shot from first person perspective or point of view that I don't think and and I'm sure Twitter will correct me if I'm wrong that anything had been shot in that perspective. And then I was totally shocked at the end of that scene when you find out that it was a child. 
Yeah, and, and you talk about Carpenter's style. Because the budget was limited, there's a lot of long shots that allowed the, the scene to breathe. That whole opening sequence is two cuts, two shots. You see it from Michael's perspective, that first person shaky POV through the eye holes and the clown mask and the breathing. And then it cuts when he walks out to his parents and you see, oh shit, the reveal, it's, it's a kid. People must have been shocked at the time. And they never did this before. Traditionally, you would see the scene and live it through the victim's eyes. Until I think Jaws came out a little bit earlier than this, and they made it popular for the first time to start seeing through the eyes of the killer. And people at the time must not know what to think. But child murder, this movie, I think, is off to a good start. Also, in the 20 days that they took to make this whole film, I think that opening scene from the point of view of the killer took four or five days. So, I mean, in perspective of the whole film in itself, I feel like they spent a lot of time making that feel suspenseful. And it worked for me. I mean, one, I was completely shocked it was a child, but I got this eerie feeling being behind the lens of the killer. Okay, but before we get carried away praising this movie, I do want to say that part <laughs> part of the reason part of the reason we didn't know it was a child is because first of all, this killer's arm is like four feet long. He picks a mask up off the ground with like out even crouching, and the arm looks like it's like a fake hand on the end of a broomstick. Then with a single like with a single slashing motion, this child who is about three feet high is somehow slashing through a, a teenage woman's breast. Like, granted, she is she is seated. But he's cutting through apparently rib and everything else with such force that she dies basically immediately. Ow. Well, well, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, listen, I, I don't know. Maybe Carrie always post coital enjoys just sitting on like the stool in her room, brushing her hair <laughs> naked. And she doesn't even think it's weird that her brother walks in. So that tells you that Michael's probably got fucking problems. But there is a theory out there that Michael has a disorder that. He only can do these acts when he has the mask on, that he can't visualize himself doing it. So as a child, he was intentionally looking up at the knife and arm so that he couldn't see what he was doing. So, Gene, you think it was just a bad shot? I think Michael's, he's learning to be a killer. Okay, so, Big D, you mentioned postcoital, which brings me to my first big question <laughs> of this movie. Did they bang? Like, so so the opening scene, you've got the guys making out with Judith on the couch. He's like, let's go upstairs. Where's Michael? She's like, I don't know. Parents are gone. They go upstairs. And then, like, two minutes later, he's coming down the stairs. They fucked? Uh, originally, There's I thought he went to- on the floor. Yes, I originally thought he went to get a condom. But as he's leaving, he says, okay, I'll call you. He had to have nutted. I mean, that was that was 30 seconds. They didn't even have time to get their clothes off, which were on oh. the floor. So it's, you know, insinuating that they had sex. And then she's sitting topless on the chair brushing her hair. I mean, they're implying that they had sex, but there was 48 mm. seconds between scenes. Well, here, here's here's another theory. He got out of there quickly. Maybe he was embarrassed. You know, maybe he opened up his pants. Never even. He just. Ugh. It happens sometimes. <laughs> I don't know. That guy looked like he was making out like a champ. He was kind of surfing on her a little bit. He was doing, you know, the boogie board on her body on the on the couch. I don't know. But listen, I actually don't blame him for nutting like that because let's talk about Judith's boobs. Oh, fantastic. Judith's boobs are I was <laughs> now this is where like the the just the disgusting part of me comes out where like when somebody beautiful or like with somebody with like great boobs dies, I'm sadder. I'm like, oh, that's a real <laughs> that's a shame. It's a travesty. And and so I was like, I was like, this is no ordinary woman. Who is this Judith? It's actually Playboy centerfold Sandy Johnson, who oh. might have the greatest rack ever filmed. And like, I was kind of pissed at Michael already for slashing them. Well, well, I just want to say here, so we don't come across the big meathead guys. I think the seventies were so much more sexy because everyone was natural. No one was yeah. perfect. Not every girl has a six pack. Not every dude is ripped. Not everybody's beautiful. God, Bob looks like he looks like he could have been the killer, right? Pubic hair is in. Yeah. So everyone looks more real. Yes, Judith is beautiful, but she's a natural 18, 20 year old girl. And that's what makes it sexy. If she had the giant fake tits like today, it would be a turnoff. I just want to send a shout out to Sandy Johnson, who is now 64 years old. And I wanted to know that I appreciate her contribution to film. So on the note of appreciating the 70s for, you know, natural beauty, I think that 
horror movies of any genre really age well. And I don't know if that's because the cheesy acting makes it that much more enjoyable. But I think that's one of the great things about these horror movies is that, you know, you can yell at the TV when there's not enough blood or you can yell at the TV when she turns the fucking lights off and things like that. But it makes it that much more enjoyable. But I, I want to ask just about some of the tropes, you know, because even though I think this is different and this movie's head and shoulders above some of the other movies that people put in the category, babysitter sex is is right up there. It's always up there. <laughs> Everybody in the 70s in this movie was looking, they were looking to get busy. They just needed a place. They didn't care. They weren't too picky. Is this babysitter shit? Does this real? Carrie, have you ever babysat? Gene, have you ever, you know, met a girl while she was babysitting? Does this shit happen or is this just like, one of Roger Roper's penthouse letter wet dreams. Wait, Carrie, weren't your parents like, wasn't one of them a babysitter for the other one? How did that work again? My no, the, dad, the, baby, the babysitter hooked them up on a blind no, date. No, no. My dad babysit my older sister. And Shut that's how my mom met my dad. Because what? my my mom's, did they? my mom's cousin, which was like her sister, was going on a few dates with my dad's brother. They're all the same age. But my what? mom had a child that was like, eight or nine, my older sister. And my mom wanted to go out with them. And my uncle said, well, my brother can watch your daughter. And so my, when my mom went to pick up my sister from oh. the babysitter, the babysitter was my dad. And he got along with my older sister really well. And he's so handsome. He was so cute. And they hit it off. And then I was born nine months later. Ergo, babysitter sex. Carrie is the product of babysitter sex. <laughs> Okay, so you have to be pretty smart to go into the medical profession. So you would think. They pull up to the fucking institution. It's creepy enough. You only see the headlights kind of going back and forth. It's dark. There's lightning. And you start to see the silhouettes of those patients just walking through the fields. In their white nightgowns. And the nurse goes, oh, I didn't know they let them out at night. How fucking stupid is she? Uh, she's stupid enough to roll down the fucking window once a <laughs> man climbs on the hood of the car. Not as stupid as the doctor to get out of the vehicle while there's a bunch of crazies in the street when he was just discussing how insane Michael Myers is. Well, I think my favorite part of the entire Michael Myers attacking the car uh, scene was when he jumped on the back of it. It made the same noise as the $6 million man. It was like, Bring! <laughs> like, oh, it's that, it's that kind of movie. All right. And that's how you know he has superpowers is because of that noise. Yeah, this began me yelling at the, you know, characters. Why would you turn the fucking lights off? Why would you roll down the window? Why would you get out of the car? And I think that's what makes the horror genre so great is that you are yelling at them for these stupid things that lead to the plot that we all know is going to happen. You know, like we know he's going to steal the car and take off or he's either going to kill them. One or the other. But I love the fact of how lean this movie is. They keep it going. You know, we've now in the first five or six minutes, we know what Michael did. We know where he's been. We know where he's going. But I don't need to know necessarily why he did it. I don't need the whole backstory, the the motivation for Michael and what's wrong with him. This movie doesn't even go there. And I think that works the film's advantage. And it's tight. I mean, it's we're we're moving pretty quick through the movie. We're not even like 20 minutes in. Talk about not explaining stuff. Dr. Loomis is just going down the street and he's like, oh, I think I'll stop here. Oh, (laughs) it's the mechanic shop where Michael clearly has been. And then Michael, oddly enough, he kills a mechanic, only takes a jumpsuit and then leaves. What the fuck? Does it switch out the car? He didn't take his car. No, just I just wanted the jumpsuit. I'm good. Thanks. Because the hospital gown would have given him away as a serial killer, but he's driving around with a face mask with crazy hair doesn't make him look suspicious at all. Fuck the face mask. He's driving around in a car that says mental hospital on the door. <laughs> and it's a station wagon. That that thing is screaming, hey, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> also, in this town, there are only like two cars that move at any given time. I think, again, speaking of the budget, they're like, all right, how many cars can we afford? They're like, uh, well, I've got a station wagon. Done. Not only is there two cars and it seems to be a small town, but for some reason later in the scenes when the two girls are driving home from school, it goes from daylight to nighttime. Like, I don't know. Did they drive six and a half hours to get home from school? Yeah, as Big D said, they got to keep the movie moving. They're like, it's got to be dark now. It's scary. It's got to be dark soon. So by the time we get home, 
Uh, that was a big fucking joint. You need to take your time. Just enjoy it. You know, you're not you're not going to suck that thing down. <laughs> but one of the things that you remember about this movie is the music and the mask. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, you know, we find out that there's a break in at the hardware store, which also doubles as Haddonfield's local Halloween shop. You know, they sell costumes. So the budget only 300 grand. Carpenter didn't have any money to hire somebody to do a creative costume. So he sent the art director out to Burt Wheeler's magic shop in Hollywood Boulevard. And he said, get something that could be creepy. That was the direction he gave. <laughs> so, so he comes back with two masks. One of them is a clown mask. And the other one is a Captain Kirk, William Shatner mask. They said, well, that's not scary either. So he said, just go do something to it. So he spray painted it white. They cut out the eye holes and made them a bit larger. So when you look at Michael, it's almost like there's a gap. There's there's a hole there where you can't see anything. They clipped up the hair. Voila, you have got Michael Myers' iconic mask, and it cost them all of $3. And, and how many times has that mask been replicated? I mean, millions and millions of times. Uh, what's amazing to me, though, is they didn't throw out the clown mask, though. They're like, oh, we can still use this, too. <laughs> exactly. Opening scene. Don't throw that shit away. We got this. I was reading an interview with William Shatner that for so many years he had no idea that that was his face and then how flattered he was after the fact to find out that, you know, this iconic mask was – the mold is his face. <laughs> yeah, well, the only thing that will go to his defense there is the art director said it was a really bad likeness to begin with, <laughs> but it was meant to be Shatner at least. All right, so the next day on Halloween, Michael stalks high school student Lori Strode. Throughout the day, Lori notices Michael following her, but her friends Annie and Linda dismiss her concerns. Loomis arrives in Haddonfield in search of Michael. After discovering that Judith Myers' headstone has been stolen from the local cemetery, Loomis meets with Annie's father, Sheriff Lee Brackett. The two begin their search at the former Myers' house, where Loomis explains that Michael is pure evil. Sheriff Brackett patrols the streets while Loomis waits and watches the house, expecting Michael to return. So I think that Carpenter hit the jackpot with Jamie Lee. You you got somebody who has some chops now down the road. She's a very well-respected actress in Hollywood. But here, her innocence. Activia. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, come on. <laughs> your, your, your digestive health is important. You know that. So her innocence and, and naivete and her lack of experience with acting, I think, helps her. Her performance, it makes it more realistic. She's uptight. She's insecure. And that's because she was like a real schoolgirl. Like a real schoolgirl? Yes. This is, I, I wrote down in my notes, I said, Jamie Lee <laughs> Curtis is a 20-year-old who looks like a 30-year-old playing a 16-year-old. She looked way too old to be in high school. She was like dressed like a, a freaking grandma with that long-ass face. Just, oh, uh, it was, <laughs> she, I was she, not having it. She did, She did have a horse face, but she grew into it. But this brings me to one of the perks of this movie is that as I'm watching this, I'm like, wait a minute, we got Linda and Judith and Lori. I'm like, we might as well throw in a Carol. This movie is basically all my friends' moms when they were teenagers. And I was like, holy shit, I understand them all now. I understand Lola Schaefer now. I get it. And I think that the dialogue just seemed genuine. I wasn't around for the 70s. I don't know. Is that how people talked? I'm not sure. All I can say is that I think Lori needs some new friends. They were fucking bitches to her. They're rude, annoying, dismissive, fake. And even later in the film when they're calling her and they're setting her up on this date for the homecoming dance and it's almost vindictive. Her friends kind of suck. When they die, I don't feel sad. Her friend sets her up with a guy and then she goes, we'll call him. And she goes, sorry, he's out drinking. Like That's, that's his activity that he's doing tonight. He's out drinking. Sorry, I can't call him. What do you think? Fucking Lori looks like she's Amish. She looks like a Quaker. What do you think? The, like the, the quarterback on the football team's looking to date her? I don't know. The uh, Those knit tights are kind of fucking hot, though. I'm not going to lie. Someone makes a comment that they're like, well, you're just too smart. Like, guys don't like you because you're just too smart. And I was like, ugh, woof. No, thanks. <laughs> woof. But besides her friends being a bit of a dick to her, she starts realizing that she thinks somebody's following her. You know, and this leads to Michael's first scare because we start to see a lot of establishing shots where we can tell that Michael's stalking her. It'll be a shot over his shoulder with the overalls. He's breathing heavy. But I'm fucking sorry. If I look out my window, I'm a girl. I look out and into the clothesline. 
There's a fucking dude, 6'5", in an overalls, in that white mask, just standing there, Call looking at me. Fuck no. I'm now. getting a kitchen knife. I'm barricading the doors. I'm leaving town. No, it doesn't take me. It doesn't take me several instances of seeing the same fucking man. Like the yes. second I see a car behind me, I'm like, I'm driving to the fucking police station. I've got my mace ready. I've got my shank ready. I've got my knife ready. Yeah. God forbid he show up on my fucking doorstep where I see him out my window. Like she sees him several times before anything happens. I'm like, no. But also, it was 1978. Come on, he doesn't need to be a serial killer. He could be just trying to rape me. That's all I need to know. There's a creeper in my backyard. He's going to Wearing rape me. a mask me. in the daytime. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think the most egregious one is when he pops out from behind the bushes. He's like 10 feet away. I'd be like, nope, I'm out of here. Uh, go, go check it out, Annie. Just go look. He says he wants Fuck your no. number. Fuck you, Annie. <laughs> Fuck your friends. So speaking of fuck Annie, fuck Annie's dad. So, okay. So Annie's dad is a sheriff. And I go now again, you're talking about this being a lean movie, big D. I'm like, okay, surely this guy will play a role at some point. Newsflash. He fucking doesn't spoiler alert. Okay. This cop, he's the only cop in town. Apparently he can't smell weed. They like smoke a joint, (laughs) which, which by the way, I got to point out, Carrie's watching the movie and she goes, yeah, you can tell this is 1978. If that was today, that joint would fucking have them both knocked unconscious. Like, yeah, I was like, if you're smoking a joint nowadays, it's like one hit and you're all fucking done. But they smoke this joint from daylight till nighttime. The entire joint between the two of them. Like, that's how you know this is the 70s when you could smoke a joint in its entirety and not think you were fucking dead in an outer space. I'm really hoping that somewhere out there on the cutting room floor, there's just John Carpenter's like reggae song that got cut from this movie for the joint scene. But <laughs> but anyway, this cop, he, he can't smell weed. He doesn't stop Michael Myers. He agrees to let some doctor from out of town tell him to just not let anybody know that there's a killer in town. <laughs> yes. But my favorite part is this fucking dude goes to the store. He's like, they stole a mask, <laughs> rope, and a bunch of knives. And he concludes in his amazing detective skills, it must be some crazy kids. And then he does that weird child molester thing with Lori where he's like all up on her on the sidewalk. I'm like, Ugh. I thought he had something to do with it. Uh, I think if you Google that, mask, duct tape, rope, and a knife, that's called a rape kit. And you show up on the FBI list after Google searching yeah. those things. Yeah, the only thing that could make that worse is if you bought a shovel. <laughs> that's it. Hello, Mr. FBI man. But you, you you say he's not a good cop. This is a small town. I don't think we see more than five adults out at any point. There's kids trick-or-treating alone, but you never see anyone at their door. Nobody's out. Maybe there's just a lack of adults in Haddonfield. The city is ran by babysitters. <laughs> babysitters try to get fucked. Yeah, they fucking run it. But Oh, it's a babysitter mafia. Why wouldn't the first thing that you would do after a um, convicted murderer escapes from an insane asylum and is suspected to go back to the town where he committed the crimes, which apparently is a small town, why would they not alert the whole fucking town, especially on a night like Halloween? Like, hey, keep your kids inside. Hey, don't go out to this party. We're going to post up what he may look like now and everybody lock your fucking doors. Instead, don't tell anyone. Let's keep it quiet. That doesn't make any sense. Hey, everybody, look for the one car going down the street that happens to be a station wagon with the (laughs) emblem of the insane asylum on it. That might be an indicator. Hey, shop owners, did anyone buy some knives, masks, and rope lately? Yeah, where the fuck is Michael filling up on gas? Because he's driving around quite a bit in Haddonfield. (laughs) But, but, uh, you know, one thing I want to say here is adults in Halloween masks are always creepy. It doesn't need to be a horror movie. I take Emma out, my daughter, last year. She's last year. She was just about two when we we took her out for Halloween, and we're walking around. There's a bunch of kids from our neighborhood, some of the adults, and all of a sudden, I look across the street, and there is a lone, look like an adult man in jeans, a button-down plaid shirt, like hanging loosely, and a large rabbit head <laughs> costume with floppy ears, and he just stood across the street, watched us. And then I swear to God, he disappeared. And it was the creepiest thing I've ever seen. I wanted to go home and get my gun. Do, 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 do. <laughs> but meanwhile, it was probably some kid going to a party and I would end up shooting him. I was say, and it turns out to be like some choir boy. 
I say Big D, what's your what's your imaginary friend's name? One thing I saw when I was reading all the trivia plots on this was that uh, this film was actually shot in the springtime. And so due to budget issues, the crew had to paint all of the leaves and every scene they would rake the leaves and then move them. So like when a car would be driving by, they would throw these painted leaves. And I guess it was pretty difficult to find any pumpkins for them to be carving, given that it was spring. So they shot this movie in California, pretended it was Illinois, and then painted the leaves Mm -hmm. to make it look like it was fall in Illinois. Just say it's in California and you're fine. You don't have to paint any leaves. No, but I don't think I don't think it's just creepy. The whole point of this is that it's every town USA. When movies are in New York and California or Chicago, big cities, it doesn't have the same effect. When you could believe that- Serial killers are more common there. (laughs) uh, Listen, what's terrifying is it could happen anywhere. And there's nothing more anywhere than, than Midwest. You know, it is any town, small town, USA. That's why it works. All right, so later that night, Lori babysits Tommy Doyle while Annie babysits Lindsay Wallace just across the street, unaware that Michael has followed them. When Annie's boyfriend, Paul, calls her to come pick him up, she takes Lindsay over to the Doyle house to spend the night with Lori and Tommy. Annie is just about to leave in her car when Michael, who is stowed away in the back seat, strangles her before slitting her throat, killing her. Okay, I understand that you're teenagers, but they are as carefree as can be. They don't care. They could have five minutes, an empty couch. They're going to try to bang. Now, I don't know if it was the 70s, but it seems like this relaxed attitude was everywhere. So I don't know if it was just Haddonfield in the 70s, but nobody locks a door. Everybody leaves their blinds open. Lights are on. Nobody has a concern. To this day, if I'm inside my house and it's dark outside, and the lights inside are leaving like a, a black mirror reflection on the window, it creeps me out. Everybody in Haddonfield seems to be completely okay with it. More than that, I was a little disturbed the fact that the parents had left Annie in charge of this child, and then she just walks the child across the street and leaves the, another teenage girl in charge of that. You know, I don't have a lot of experience babysitting, but if I – left my child with somebody, and then I found out that while I was paying this person to watch my child, they just walked across the street, dumped him off on someone else who is a teenager that maybe they do or do not know to go get fucked somewhere on my dollar. I'd be pissed. Dude, but they're not even trying to hide the fact that they're getting fucked. They're talking about it in front of the kid. Like, the kid is an accomplice. They're like, hey, Kathy, listen, Bobby's going to come over. We're going to go upstairs. You just don't, don't, don't knock on the door. The kid's going to tell, hey, what happened? What did you guys do while we were at the movies? Oh, well, you know, Annie was upstairs with Bobby, and I heard a lot of screaming. The kid's going to tell the parents. All right, I got a couple of things to say. One, Lindsay, the little girl, does not give a fuck who's fucking. That She's chill as hell. She's just watching TV. She doesn't care. Maybe she wants to listen. But Annie, we've, Annie, we've established, is a shitty friend. She's a shitty babysitter. But more than that, she's a shitty actress. Uh. So when we watched In the Mouth of Madness, I was talking about how inorganic the phone scenes seemed. Like it was like, I am talking on a telephone Mm -hmm. to another human being. Those scenes were flawless compared to Annie on the phone. You can literally, if you watch that scene where she's talking with Lori on the phone, you can literally see her eyes reading the cue cards. The conversation pacing is all wrong. Like she's not talking at the same pace as the person on the other end of the phone. And she can't seem to decide on her voice inflection. (laughs) This woman was, aside from a few nudie scenes, completely worthless on screen. I think when they were trying to find the actress, they brought him in. They got him down to their underwear and then see if they could make popcorn. Yeah, I just love the logic of a slasher film here. So (laughs) she spills butter on her shirt. So she strips down to her panties in the house where she's baby. It's not even her house. In the house where she's Whose babysitting, shirt like, the was parents that? come home. Who shirt was that? I need a robe. I need a robe, Annie. <laughs> or no, yeah. what's the then, kid's name? Her name's Annie. Lindsay. 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 I need Lindsay. a robe, Lindsay. And then, so I'm sorry. If I'm babysitting and I spill butter on my shirt, you know where I go? I go, fuck, I got some butter on my shirt. I do not take my clothes off and then go do laundry immediately and then get stuck in a window and then just wiggle my ass around at eye level and moan a bunch like that is nobody acts like that well i gotta tell you i I, we've never met gene but i'm confident you don't have an ass that looks like hers that's why you put that in the (laughs) shot i'm i don't i don't think your hairy ass would work like that but what the movie does here remember it's a horror movie we're now far enough along that they've shown us michael out 
they've kept baiting us like, oh, this is going to be it. This is when he's going to attack. Oh, this is going to be it. When she walks out to the to the laundry room, I was convinced she was fucking done. I said, she's dead. So every time, because that's what traditionally the movies do, the doors are like kind of banging or, you know, the window. I was convinced she was dead. And at this point, I don't know what to think because they've already sub. I don't want to use Roger's line because he said like 17 times in the last podcast. It subverted my expectation of the typical horror trope. The jump scares started to work because I didn't know when they were really going to happen. Yeah, I think Carrie, when we were watching it, goes, uh, she goes, what, she's getting killed and all she's saying is, ow, ow? <laughs> like, no, no, she's she's stuck in a window. But I thought the same thing. I thought, oh, she's dead because Michael Myers right there. The guy, he hunts like a coral reef. Like, he just sits there and waits for you to run into him. And he's like, ah, I, I fucking guess. All right, I guess. Coral I reef. <laughs> but no, like, they, they do a lot of things, I think, that are subtle and work. So she not only does one trip to the laundry room, she does two. She goes back to get her car keys, goes out to the garage again. And of course, Michael is is laying in the back seat. And ladies, if you're going to a parking lot, here's my safety tip for you. Always check your back seat before you get in your car. And also, if you go out to your car and there's a van parked on your driver's side, you could potentially be looking at it in an abduction situation. Just be safe. Uh, put your keys between your fingers. Be ready to defend yourself or enter through the passenger seat. That's my safety tip of the day. But when she walks up, I'm going to the- go step further and say, also look under the car so you don't get your Achilles tendon cut and then you can't drive away. That's how fucking paranoid I am. Oh, oh OK. <laughs> uh, go, go. Thank God that Carrie's recording from her panic room. But <laughs> when she walks up to the car, if you pay attention, you can see that the inside windows are fogged. And I'm like, oh, shit, what's that? She gets in the car. And, of course, Michael's in the back seat, like. (sighs) 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 But this is where we get to learn about Michael. He is an intimate killer. He doesn't just quickly. It's not about we're Friday the 13th. You see the blood. You see the arterial spray all over the window. Michael gets his hands on her throat. And he, he could kill her but he's just slowly working it. You can see he gets a pleasure out of watching. There's an intimacy to the way he murders them until the point where he finally uses a blade. But there's something creepy about how calm and methodical he is. And I'm scared now as a kid, I must've been just shitting my pants. And to touch again on how John Carpenter builds that suspense with the lack of dialogue and the slow killing, it's like the deep breathing is terrifying. For me, you know, instead of him screaming at her and she's screaming back at him and, you know, it takes a long time and they're struggling in blood like it's a slow kill, but it's this quiet eeriness that I think that he uh, builds up with his soundtrack and things like that. But where's the blood? He stabs her. Where's the blood? Where's the anybody who gives a shit? So this is another thing I don't understand. They are right (laughs) across the street from the house where Lori is. The horn is honking. And then Tommy, that kid is a is a, he's a moron. He, he is he's sitting right across the street. He looks out there. He sees a guy carrying the corpse of Annie, who was just in the house 15 minutes ago. He knows who she is. And what does he say? It's the boogeyman. It's the boogeyman. He doesn't go. Yeah. There is a man carrying a lifeless exactly. corpse across the street. It's a boogeyman. For fuck's sake, Lori, let's do something about this. I I, I wanted him to die. That's because kids aren't reliable. I agree. Yeah. I was surprised none of the kids got fucking killed because they're all so stupid. Spoiler alert. No, they should. No, that's again, that's the unwritten rule, though. Friday the 13th. It's 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 all these movies are making some sort of a moral statement, right? It's like, okay, the the bad people, the you know, the the people shaking their titties around and smoking weed. They're the ones that are going to die. You know, Bob's going to die. Not not Tommy. Tommy's innocent, pure. Lindsay's innocent, pure. Kids are awful. Soon after, Linda and her boyfriend, Bob Sims, arrive at the Wallace house. After having sex, Bob goes downstairs to get a beer for Linda, but Michael stabs him with a knife, which pins him to the wall, killing him. Michael then poses as Bob in a ghost costume and confronts Linda, who teases him, having no effect. Linda calls Lori, and just as Lori picks up, Michael strangles Linda to death with the telephone cord. Meanwhile, Loomis discovers the stolen car and begins combing the streets. So I understand you need to have a situation and a reason why. uh, What's Bob's girlfriend name? Linda. Linda. Yeah. So why Bob and Linda would come over 
Bob's got a fucking sweet ass seventy shagging wagon. Why is he going to risk getting caught banging in some somebody's house? Park that shit out by the reservoir, out by the woods. Start banging out in that van. No, it's because Bob and Linda aren't normal teens. They're sexual deviants. If you listen to the conversation oh. that they have before they go in, he gives the rundown of how the sex is going to go, like the order they're going to do it, the room they're going to do it in, and the fact uh. that it's going to include Lindsay. Lindsay's the little girl. He's like, and then Lindsay's going to join in. Shut what? the fuck up. That's f- yes. No, he gonna- doesn't. No, I didn't I- hear that. Watch it. Watch the movie. I was like, who's Lindsay? And I was like, oh, my God, Lindsay's the little kid. Uh, I don't know what? about this. We're going to have to go to the tape. We're going to have to do, what do they call it? The fucking, the VAR? We're going to have to go back and watch the tape. Fucking sick. But all I know is Bob is a godsend because for the first year this year, I haven't known months ahead what I was going to be for Halloween. And then Bob just, the ghost of Bob is like, this is it. All you need is a white sheet, some glasses, an unreliable erection, a phone cord. Like I'm fucking doing ghost of Bob. That's, that's me. Halloween 2018. (laughs) So you're not actually the ghost of Bob. You are the Michael Myers Bob. He pins Bob to the fucking wall. He sits there and looks at him for like 20 seconds. Nothing else but Michael looking. His head is turning side to side like a dog. He then throws on the sheet and shuffles upstairs. You have to, Gene, when you wear your Halloween costume, (laughs) shuffle and then start just tilting your head side to side. You're going to make some people uncomfortable. Speaking of his uh, pinning him, Bob, to the wall, can we talk about this insane strength that, like, how do you strangle somebody while holding them up with one arm and then stabbing someone through their abdomen that the knife goes deep enough through the body and into the wall that it holds him to the wall? See, I'm looking at Michael Myers and thinking he's not that efficient a killer, though. As Big D said, he's he's kind of inefficient. So... It got me thinking because I, I started doing Krav Maga when I was uh, back in 2004. And I love it. But one of the weird things is the first defenses they teach you was against chokes. And I was like, look, I've been in my share of fights. I've been punched. I've been kicked. I've been tackled. I've been headlocked. I've been cut. I have never once been choked by anybody with one hand, like one handed choke to my neck. And maybe that's more common if you're a woman. But listen, guys, if you ever want to defend yourself against Michael Meyer, it's simple. Uh, you do a proper pluck, you do your speed against their strength, and you counterattack. Go for something soft like their balls. EVKMSelfDefense.com. <laughs> Listen, he's he's had nothing to do for the last 15, 16 years in that asylum. Then work out. Maybe he's hitting the weights. You know, maybe he's getting like prison ripped. I have to mention that while we're watching this, it's about this time that Gene is like, I kind of feel bad for Michael. And I turn around, I'm like, what? Yeah. And he's like... I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, he just killed like half a dozen people, like teenagers. And he's like, well, they don't even, they don't even tell us why. Like, I just, I just wonder what happened to him as a child. So I'm reading through my notes and and interviews with Carpenter. And he said that he made it a point that he intentionally didn't give Michael Myers any background because he didn't want the audience to be able to relate to him. And Gene's like, he seems like just a troubled kid. I'm like, what? Yeah, I, I think he's fairly righteous. He's a religious warrior. He only kills people who are sinning. He's killing people who deserve it. Maybe Michael was raised on the good book and he's going to make the sinners pay. His sister was promiscuous. He kills her. He comes downstairs. He doesn't go after the parents. He doesn't kill anyone else. He waits for you to sin. We don't know what that truck driver did who he took his overalls. Maybe he made a pass at him. We don't know. So why is he trying to kill Jamie Lee Curtis? He tries to kill her later. At that point, he's already heard the conversation on the telephone about her date. And he just thinks she's one of the promiscuous girls like the rest of them. So, uh, I mean, maybe he's doing God's work in some strange roundabout way. To find out, watch Halloween's two and four. But she might have been okay if Loomis wasn't so fucking clueless. Loomis is now positioned outside like a creeper in the bushes outside Michael's house. And he's not doing too good a job because the sheriff sneaks up on him. And then Michael seems to park his car 30 feet away from Loomis. And it takes him like two or three hours to notice it. He turns around and goes, oh, wow, that's the station wagon that I was driving in with the emblem on the side. And it's right there. How funny was it when the kids try to like break into the old house 
and he's just in the bushes like, get your yeah. ass out of here. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Come here. I got candy for you, kids. Get, can- get your asses out of here. Yeah, there's, there's a strange man in an overcoat telling us he's going to do something with our asses. <laughs> Suspicious, Lori goes over to the Wallace house. There, she finds the corpses of Annie, Bob, and Linda in an upstairs bedroom, as well as Judas Myers headstone. Horrified, Lori cowers in the hallway when Michael suddenly appears and attacks her, slashing her arm. Barely escaping, Lori races back to the Doyle house. How heavy do you think that fucking headstone is? I Googled it. I know. Oh, you know? Yeah, an average headstone of that size ranged from 120 to 150 pounds. <laughs> okay. So he fucking digs that up, yeah. puts it in the back of that station wagon, yeah. places this body in this bed, drags that headstone at 120 uh-huh. pounds, places it on the bed. Okay. I can kind of believe that, but again, and I'm not trying to be a nag, but where the fuck is the blood? These people have been stabbed and strangled and pinned to walls, and there's no blood. None. Was it not? Was corn syrup not in the budget? Carrie, I think you missed your calling as a defense attorney. You're like, let's establish a timeline here. How did he get the headstone from there to there? There's no blood. I mean, clearly, clearly no crime. You cannot tie Michael Myers. You all know I've watched a lot of Law and Order. You're missing it again. Did you notice the presentation that Michael did of the corpse and the headstone? It was beautiful. He had candles. He had pumpkins. It was nice. He set it up. He wanted to have the most maximum effect. He hung the one. Where did he get those pumpkins from? It's fucking Halloween. They filmed it in the (laughs) spring. Get out of here, fucking Judge Judy. They have the dude hanging in the closet. (laughs) He positions him to spring out. Michael probably changed the linens. He wanted it to be presentable, changed the clothes. You get the wow factor when you walk in and that beautiful, shiny headstone's there. But yeah, Michael's fucking strong. All I took away from this entire attack was that Lori sucks at hiding. And again, this is one of those horror movie tropes, but I'm with her so far. Like she's running away from him. She opens that balcony door and then she goes and hides in the closet. I'm like, okay, I would have jumped off the balcony, but let's see where the fuck this trick gets us. Right. (laughs) So she goes Gets in the closet. I'm like, okay, I'm with you so far. And then starts audibly whimpering. Like, Michael Myers is slow. He's not deaf. He knows exactly where you are. See, you think ideally that you could control your your body's response. And that's why people fail lie detector tests. You can't control this. I think we all believe we'd be cool and we'd be hiding in the closet stoically. I think a majority of us would probably be freaking out and whimpering too. Listen, I'm saying my family got into the U.S. after the Iranian Revolution, so we can keep our fucking mouth shut when we're being searched for. (laughs) Okay, Persians can hide. Persians can run. Why the fuck doesn't Lori run? Get the fuck out of there. Why does she turn the lights off? Why does she continue to stay in the house? He's attacked her several times, and she continues to stay in there. And then even when she runs out, she runs back into the house after Well, she runs out of the house and she, I don't know if at that point she has a leg injury, right? So she's limping a bit. Michael's not in any rush. He's just fucking lollygagging behind her. He's he's staying a creepy enough distance away that you can see him, but there's no imminent threat. She's knocking on doors and people are like, just not even answering the door. This is small town USA. I would hope they'd open the door, but they might not. She then takes the next most questionable move ever. Anyone who has kids, and you two don't have kids, but I'm going to give you a little insight into children. Don't rely on children whenever anything is time sensitive or urgent. (laughs) It doesn't work. They will not act quickly. I can be late for work and telling Emma, Emma, come on, we got to go. We got to get in the car. We got to get in the car. Her brain shuts off and she'll just start wandering aimlessly the other direction. If this was real world, Tommy would have taken about 45 minutes to get downstairs and Lori would be dead at the door. So we're made to believe that you never see Michael Myers running, but Lori falls off the banister, lands on the first floor, gets up, runs through the neighborhood screaming for help, and then makes it back to the house without him attacking her. Would she survive that fall in the first place? I mean, she, she, I think she'd survive. I think I, I could see that part. At least someone get that nitpicky in the sense that if I fell like off a second floor, landed on some stairs, 
I'd probably be really hurt, but like the adrenaline kind of takes over. And you're like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. But what's great is that if, if you watch uh, Michael Myers, too, he's kind of got like a, a Danny Glover shuffle as he's coming down, you know. <laughs> yes. too. So, so he does pick it up a little bit when he's coming across the street. You remember, this is his hometown. He knows every backyard. He knows every trick. But he's not in any rush, and and I gotta love it. He knows how to pace himself. All right. So in the grand finale, Michael breaks into the Doyle house and attacks Lori again. But she manages to fend him off long enough for Tommy and Lindsay to escape. Lori defends herself by stabbing Michael with a knitting needle, a metal hanger, and his own knife. But Michael reanimates and attacks Lori. Loomis sees the two children fleeing the house and goes to investigate, finding Michael and Lori fighting upstairs. He shoots Michael six times, knocking him off the balcony. When Loomis goes to check on Michael's body, he finds it missing. And Loomis stares off into the night while Lori begins sobbing in terror. Uh, Okay, so... I really, I'm loving this movie, and I think it's subverting a lot of the typical horror tropes. So I'm happy with 99% of it. The only thing that bothers me, and this is in every fucking stupid horror movie, she gets him in the neck with a fucking knitting needle. Giant. He's down for the count first. This is across the street. That would be his carotid artery. He would die uh, within six minutes. Listen, maybe, maybe she missed it. Let's just say, right? Whatever it is. He's on the ground. Stand up, look over him, and just keep stabbing that shit into his head. Everybody in these movies, when they're in a situation where they can put the final kill shot, people get up and leave. Don't ever walk over the body. When somebody's down for the count, whether it's a a wire hanger in the eye, a knitting needle, you're shot a couple times, take the opportunity, pounce, kill, leave their head mush. I think in Friday 13th Part 4, one of the Corys butchers Jason's head. That's what I would do. And that's what you should do. All right. So here's the thing is we each watch this independently at home on a TV screen. Try to imagine watching this in a theater with like a hundred other people. Or if you're with a group of friends and you're all drinking some beers and stuff and this scene is happening, it's so much fun because you're like, oh, yeah. fuck, what do yeah. you know? Don't do it. Everybody's screaming. And <laughs> yes. I think that's what they're going for. They're not They're not trying to make it realistic. Honestly, if, if she had just textbook just stabbed him a shit ton of times, <laughs> yeah, I would have been like, okay, well, that was smart. But it's so much more satisfying when you're just like, why the fuck? Especially when they do that thing where they just drop the weapon on the ground right next to the guy. Right you're like, the why would you do that? Why would you drop it? I Honestly, even if your brain isn't functioning, I'd be holding on to that fucking weapon probably for the next week. Like, I'm not dropping it. Fuck yeah. As someone that sees dead bodies on a regular basis, even if I knew for sure he was fucking dead, like I didn't see chest rise and fall anymore. I checked him and he didn't have a pulse. And someone that sees and is in sharing space with dead bodies, I would have to leave my fucking house. Like... Not only does she not check to see that he's dead and smash his head into a million pieces, but she's just like, oh, okay, all right, I'm going to walk around, do this thing. And then his body is reanimating in the background behind her. As soon as I thought someone was dead, I'd have to get the fuck out of my house. I could not sit in my living room knowing there was a dead body in there. I would then feel safe enough that I could leave. And if if I had to pound on every fucking neighbor's door and they weren't answering and responding, like I would walk my ass to the sheriff's station and be like, there is a dead body in my house. Why she stays, even if he's dead or not, is is beyond me. Yes, it's nerve wracking. She eventually she turns her back on Michael again and starts to talk to the children. But there is no more iconic shot, I think. This has got to be up there, top 10. If you think about iconic horror movie shots, where Jamie's now, she's hiding in the closet. Lori's whimpering. She's in the back corner. It's those old 70s, you know, the the, the, the wood slats. And Michael comes up to it. He knows where she is because she's she, she's freaking out. She's whimpering. You can, you can hear it. It sounds like a wounded dog. So he comes up to the doors and just starts jiggling them. Like, choo-choo-choo-choo. And she starts panting more, jiggling him. He's fucking with her. He could kill her instantly. Yeah, I saw that. In t- I saw that scene differently. I I, I was kind of like, he's super strong. He can lift a dude up. He can strangle you to death with one hand. He's having trouble getting through a closet door because at one point he decides to break through it, and he's still like, he's struggling. No, he's fucking with her. Also, keep in mind he's wearing a giant William Shatner mask. His peripheral vision isn't that great. <laughs> He's also been stabbed in the neck, so he's not doing <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah, he's, he's a little lightheaded. 
But, you know, the, the question here I have then is because we've now seen him stabbed with the knitting needle, wire hanger to the eye. He's been pretty badly injured. Can he die? I mean, do you guys think that, that Michael could theoretically die? No, I mean, I, I think that the answer comes, you know, if there was any doubt when Dr. Loomis shoots him. First of all, why does Dr. Loomis have a gun and why is and he's he's just roaming around? He's not a doctor. He's not a fucking doctor. <laughs> he's not a doctor. Get your asses out of here. He's a doctor like Detective Lucero was a cop in Gleaming the Cube. This guy's not a fucking doctor, but he shoots him six times at close range. <laughs> yes. Dude falls off a balcony and he's like up and gone. Uh, yeah. He's not dying anytime soon. So I didn't get that. Like, is is there something, because I haven't seen any of the sequels, is there something that alludes to why he's got this super strength? I, I will point out, though, that there is some explanation. If you go, like, through the first, I think, eight movies, that there's this, like, cult, and apparently, like, allegedly or, or theoretically, like, the cult did some sort of rituals that made this child different, whatever. Um, but it's really critical that he does get up and go because one of the really fascinating things that I, that I really like about this movie is that uh, Halloween 2 picks up on the same night. Like It's yeah. not like five years later or anything like that. It's literally, okay, they're going to the hospital to get treated, and Michael Myers, he's not done. Like The shit's still going on. I think that's really, really a cool take on, on a horror movie where typically, if you look at the Friday the 13th and the... Nightmare on Elm Street, they tend to have a couple years lapse between the, the sequels. Yeah. So one final question here for you, Carrie, you, you mentioned earlier about how you'd get out of the house with the dead body. You couldn't be there. Could you live? Cause the Meyer house has been empty for 15 years. Would you have any problem? You get a good deal on a house where the family was murdered. Do you have a problem living there? Nope. The house I grew up in, the woman had died in the house. And I'll tell you, that almost everywhere that you are ever going to occupy space, somebody has already died there. So I have no problem with it. I don't I don't believe in ghosts or anything like that. But I mean, if there was some horrific murder and there was like blood on the walls and the carpet and they're trying to sell me the house like that, like maybe not. But fuck yeah, I would live in the Sharon Tate house. So Gene, as our resident ghost hunter, I need to rely upon you uh, in your expertise, is it safe for me to move into a home where somebody's life was violently taken? Yeah, chances are there is no apparition or or any sort of presence there. I uh, in 2010, I, I wouldn't do it though. Honestly, I wouldn't do it, and the reason why I wouldn't do it is that I think that my mind would just fuck with me. Honestly, uh, but in in 2010, I bought a house uh, that it only had one owner before, and she died. But as the realtor is showing me the home. She says, yeah, it's had one owner. It was built for her by her son, Custom. And then she died. And so now he put it on the market. And then she looks at me. She goes, but don't worry. She didn't die in the house. I'm like, <laughs> okay. And then she goes, and it's not haunted. I was like, well, thank you. Two bedroom, one bath, not haunted. No, but it, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't do it. That being said, I, I wouldn't mind owning a property that was haunted. Just like a visitor from time to time. Quickly before we wrap up for our scores, I, I wanted to because I've been talking so much shit about music on every pod that we've done. You know, fuck ACDC, Maroon 5. Um, one of what? the... What? <laughs> yeah! Woo! Fuck yeah! Woo! <laughs> Nothing's better than this, Carrie. You just have that queued up at all times? Is that a oh, fucking fu bookmark just... on your computer? I'm so happy. You just set me up for that. I got to get some Maroon 5 now, too. Um, I was going to say, John Carpenter is uh, like one of my favorite composers and does amazing soundtracks. And so for anyone that doesn't, he has uh, in 2017 came out with a Lost Themes album. And it's like a lot of famous artists covered or collaborated with him on a lot of his um, songs. And it's it's pretty good. It's, it's one of my favorite things about this movie is that, you know, it's a very um, – distinct quintessential song that as soon as you play it, everybody knows it's fucking Halloween. All right. So that's a discussion of Halloween just in time for Halloween guys. It's time to rate this movie on the chat scale. Again, if you are not familiar with the chat scale, it goes a bit in reverse. A five white movie is an absolute uh, piece of trash. It is uh, a smushed pumpkin under your body. after you've been bullied by schoolyard boys. A zero white movie is a perfect movie. 
Uh, it is flawless. It is clean as Annie's sheets. So, Big D, we'll start with you. What is your score for Halloween? Uh, I I was originally going to go with with one wipe, but I'm going to do what I know you hate. I'm going to go 0.75 wipes. I think it's better than my original one wipe. The, the movie ends with Lori crying. She's shaking. She's clearly in shock. She's traumatized. She's fucked up. She'll never recover. And I know how she felt because as a kid, this movie did that same thing to me. It made me afraid of windows at night. It's it's iconic and it really impacted my life. And after the movie, I found myself walking around the house to make sure that all my <laughs> windows were closed. All my windows were locked. My alarm was on. It still creeped me out and made me uneasy. And what capped it off for me is, yes, there are some shortcomings to the film. But when the credits roll up, it is maybe 25 seconds of credits. It is incredible to watch. There is 21 actors, 23 crew members, six sound and music, and only four songs. Now, they don't make movies like this anymore. And you couldn't imagine trying to make it on that budget. It caused them to be creative to break new ground. They created something that's iconic and has now lasted eight films, 30 years. Uh, The only flaw I would have made Michael more human, but you wouldn't have gotten eight movies out of it. But I think it's a 0.75. It is as good as you could have done for that time, that money, that crew. I really loved it. All right. So that's three quarters of a wipe from big D. Uh, I've got to say that I I do deeply respect what they did with so little, and I, I hear you, Big D. But this movie failed to do the key thing it's supposed to do for me, and it did, it, which is scare me. It didn't scare me at all. It didn't interest me at all. It didn't even make me laugh. Um, it had some great slasher movie boobs, and it had a, a solid soundtrack. But otherwise, I was just bored. I wanted it to be over. Um, like I said. You know, Mike Myers is the coral reef of hunters. This was the coral <laughs> reef of horror movies. It just, I kept wanting something to happen. And I think that horror movies have come so far. If you think about, uh, you know, The Ring or you think about uh, The Lady in White or any of those movies, uh, they've, they've really now will terrify you. And I just can't relate to it. Um, I felt like it was, I respect what it did as a prototypical horror movie, but it's just not that good at scaring me. So I've got to go four wipes. Um, I agree with both of you that I think they did a lot with a small budget and, you know, it's known as uh, one of the most successful independent films of all time. So with that lens on while watching it, um, I do see it as iconic. I think uh, Michael Myers is up there with Jason and Freddy Krueger and Chucky and Evil Dead as far as like classic horror villains go. And it's done with such simplicity that it, it, you know, the thrill relies a lot on the buildup and tension. And, you know, there's not a lot of dialogue or props or effects and the suspense and anticipation with the soundtrack that I I, I genuinely like. Um, I think with a bigger budget and maybe some better acting, um, this could have been a lot better. But I think it still holds up. And I would say that in the last few movies that we've watched, this has been probably one of the most enjoyable ones. So I'm going to have to give it like a midway score of 2.5. Okay, so that's 2.5 wipes from Carrie, four wipes from me, and three quarters of a wipe from Big D, which brings us to an average of 2.416 repeating for Halloween. That puts it now in the 43 spot. It is worse than Casino. It is better than The Fifth Element. But uh, I, I think it deserves a little bit better, but I'm okay I with think if I'd seen it before, I might have some nostalgia, you know, associated with it. But for me, I think I just see where it could have been better. So uh, now with that score, uh, we will move on to more spooky movies this month. But before that... Uh, it's time for our shout outs. Uh, shout outs are our way of saying thank you for listening to the podcast and visiting the website, shoutthemovies.com. Uh, so we've got a few shout outs. The first one comes from Chris Cervantes. It says, hey, guys, loving your podcast and can't wait for my weekly hit. Also, shout outs to Grant from Mars, Pat McGovern, Oystein from Honifas, Chris and Tom from Manchester, UK. Uh, sorry about your result this week, guys. Uh, Joshua Smith, Spags Getty. Teresa, North Star Ken, Sarah from Perth, Western Australia, Nelson, Millie Money, Dean and Karen from Ipswich, and Wes Green from Instagram. 
Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to hear your name read on the podcast, please go to shoutthemovies.com. Find any of the boxes on any of the screens that says shout out, put your name in there, and we'll read it on the pod. So are you guys going to see the new Halloween? Yes, I think it looks promising. Yeah. It's supposed to negate all the sequels and pick up where it left off. Do we know? I haven't seen any trailers or anything. I'll be honest. I've purposely avoided reading up on it because just like the Rob Zombie sequels that I didn't want to get disappointed again. Uh, I will make an effort. I will not probably go see it in the theaters because just people on the phones. It's not it's not a great experience. I will definitely try to see it as soon as I can. Fucking old old man Ebert over here. No, people I'm on the phones. Those kids and the price of the sodas texting. and the popcorn. Oh. <laughs> um, I just want to point out that Danny McBride was involved in the writing of the new Halloween. So that alone, I think, is a, is a good reason to be involved. Also, interestingly, one of Mustafa Akkad's uh, sons, Malek, is involved in the production of it. So I think that's pretty cool. Little little homage. Uh, but it's a direct sequel to Halloween. But it's 40 years later. Oh. So it negates everything that happened after part one, and it picks up 40 years after. Awesome. So yeah, it sounds pretty promising. Uh, Speaking of promising, Big D, what do we have coming up next week for Shat the Movies? Okay, so we're going to stick with the Halloween theme, and we were discussing what movie we were going to do next. Uh, And since we've already done Nightmare on Elm Street, we've done Halloween, why don't we complete the trifecta, and we are going to do the original Friday the 13th. So you don't even need to stay to the trailers. You know what we're doing, but why not give it a lesson? Hell to the yes. I love Friday the 13th. It's the things nightmares are made of. All right. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. Facebook, search for Shat the Movies Podcast. The website is shatthemovies.com. You can email us your ideas for categories or feedback on the podcast at hosts at shatthemovies.com, where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by iTunes, please leave a review that helps the podcast grow. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, and Game of Thrones. You can find all that information on our website, ShatOnTV.com. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert, and Carrie Gross, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us uh, next time for Friday the 13th. And I want to send a special uh, message of love to uh, Roger Roper, who can't be with us. Uh, he's going through... Uh, a tough time with the loss of his father. So, Raj, we love you. I uh, can't wait till you can come back and take all the time you need, buddy. And on a lighter note, Big D, let's roll that trailer. Hello? Who's that? Oh, hi. What are you doing out in this mess? One. Two. You're doomed. You're all doomed. Three. We weren't doing anything. We were just messing up. Four.
Friday, the 13th. You may only see it once, but that will be enough. Friday, the 13th. <laughs>